Hello, welcome to this week's Innovate Queensland Grid webinar for giving research and ideas direction. My name is John Matthew from Impact Innovation Group and we deliver the Innovate Queensland program which supports the Queensland Government's Advanced Queensland Initiative. Today we have Louise Brockman, a founder and managing director of the Advisory Board Centre, who will describe how entrepreneurs and business owners are fast-tracking results with the help of their advisory boards. She will also explain the differences between the governance and informal and formal advisory boards, the benefits of a formalised advisory board and the factors to consider when setting up or joining an advisory board. Just while we're waiting, for other people to join and connect into the webinar, I'll go through some of the tools we'll be using for, these, for those people who haven't viewed a webinar using the Citric Go to Webinar. The screen should look like this a slide in the center and a control panel or dashboard on the right. This control panel will collapse automatically when you're not using it. So to keep it open, just click the view menu up at the top and uncheck auto hide control panel. During the webinar, we might ask you a question so you can better understand your experience with the topic. We'll ask you to raise your hand and to do that, just click the little blue hand icon on the side of the control panel. Remember to lower your hand afterwards just by clicking the icon again. There's also this opportunity to ask questions during the webinar. So that the webinar can smooth, flow smoothly, we can, and we can stick to time allocated, we'd prefer to answer all questions at the end, but please feel free to send us your questions as they occur to you. We also have some handouts for you, which you can access and download by clicking on this section here. Now, in just a moment, I'm going to hand the screen over to Louise. Louise is an award-winning strategy advisor in the service sector who has chaired several commercial advisory boards since 2006. She's most known for her global business and research. She's founded the Advisory Board Center, HR Coach International Network, and the HR Coach Research Institute with over 100, 135 offices in eight, in, in eight countries. Louise mentors in the tech startup space, including iLab, Mentoring for Growth with the Queensland Government and the Global Social Franchise Task Force, supporting social enterprises in emerging economies. So Louise, welcome to the webinar. Thanks, John, and um, welcome everybody. Um, I appreciate the opportunity to be able to um, have this time with you and talk all things advisory boards. Do have a little disclaimer up front. I've got a little bit of a flu, so um, I uh, had the uh, wonderful opportunity of leading a trade mission to China uh, last week, and I got home uh, midnight on Monday, oh, on Sunday night, <clears throat> and uh, and managed to bring back a flu. So I apologise um, up front. So bear with me. Um, advisory boards giving businesses a competitive edge is really what I want to talk about. Um, and please send your questions through because I want to make sure it's really relevant to you um, and uh, uh, clearly understand what this emerging uh, business model is about um, and how it's really unlocking incredible value in the entrepreneur space. Um, I'll just talk through the, um, uh, the actual uh, purpose of an advisory board. Um, our purpose is to uh, build advisory boards for them to be a practical pathway for businesses to improve their competitiveness, innovation and to really drive ec net economic impact. Um, Queensland um, uh, Premier Anastasia Palaszczuk two years ago said that a growing business is a business that has 20% uh, growth per annum. We look for that as a minimum benchmark for an advisory board to have uh, with, a, with a business and to do that with an effective way of engaging advisors. Uh, we know that in, um, often uh, business owners are not really uh, articulate and uh, know what they want from their advisors. Um, so if they do that effectively and engage with them effectively, the results should go to the bottom line. Uh, so that's really um, our purpose around advisory boards. Um, so I just want to go through um, 
just some simple definitions about what an advisory board is. Um, an advisory board is around providing uh, a group of professionals providing strategic advice to really assist with decision making that's done internally. It's not binding. Um, and uh, this is where it's significantly different to what a governance board is. Um, it gives business owners in inherent flexibility um, in the way that they can build their advisory board and how they access their advisory board and what the agenda is, compared to a pretty rigid and rightly so um, um, a process where you have board of directors when it's binding. Um, so simple definitions. Um, a governance board um, is a binding environment. Uh, so it's a decision-making model. And that, that decision that's made at a governance board is binding to the business and it's also binding to the directors that sit on that board. So it's a serious undertaking um, for, for everybody that's involved. Um, governance boards have been in the spotlight in Australia. Um, in the, in the corporate sector um, and uh, you know when we look at the business sector which we're all involved with um, I imagine what, what kind of uh, you know concerns would be um, I guess raised from the way governance boards are operated in the entrepreneurs market or what we call the mid market. Mid market is defined as 1.5 million to 100 million dollar turnover. Um, so where a governance board is a decision making uh, model, um, advisory boards is a problem solving model. So the advisors are in a evaluating options mode um, and the decision stays with the business owner, not with the advisors. Um, and so for most entrepreneurs where they, um, and they love this model because um, they want the support, they want the ongoing support just about their business in a confidential manner. They want to be able to have advisors that are fit for purpose for their business and selected for their specific skill sets, um, experience and also contacts. Um, but they're not giving away the farm with regards to that is my decision to make, it's my business. So they don't lose control um, over their business. And that's what I did back in 2006. I had an advisory board for my business and it was it was really groundbreaking um, for not only for the business but also for me personally. And I have an advisory board now, even though I, I run the advisory board centre, we've got to practice what we preach. Um, and it is, uh, it, is, it is just such a breath of fresh air and it's such a fresh approach and it forces you to step up um, and be held accountable and to be the best you can possibly be. And for me, um, I was able to step up, but also because I was stepping up, so was the business. And we achieved things that um, I, I uh, didn't even dream of before um, because I knew I had a group of people that I purposely selected for specific things. Um, and they had the expectation that I would be on my A game. And, um, and then I knew I had a group of people that had my back um, that also was a constant um, in, in my support and a compass for my future direction. So I wasn't second guessing the decisions I made. I was making deliberate, um, really specific decisions that once I made a decision, you stay on course. And that's really that problem solving component of an advisory board means that um, uh, that's you, you're able to road test your ideas and thinking, but you're not restricted. So that is my decision to make and I'll live and die by that decision. Um, and it makes, makes you very confident um, uh, longer term. And, and I see that when on chair boards now, the way they make decisions in their business after six months is significantly different to when they first start um, evaluating what an advisory board actually does for them. Um, just want to talk through where advisory boards sit in the market uh, versus many other ways that businesses actually engage advisors. Um, I see the advisory community in Australia is really, um, uh, it's really vibrant and there are many different advisor models for different reasons and, and advisory boards don't replace them. It's, it's another model that um, when it's the right time and the right place, it's a really good mechanism to be able to engage with advisors. It doesn't replace other types of advisory 
services um, uh, when a business may need a different type of service um, and support than, than another. Um, so I built this model um, uh, based on the way that I view the market from a uh, way, the way businesses access advisors from an informal um, capacity through to the most formal. So I'll start at the informal end. Um, businesses will engage advisors in a really informal way where first of all, we'll start with family and friends. The Sunday afternoon barbecue is a, is a typical sort of example for that through to peers in business and uh, saying uh, um, accessing each other and being able to talk about business. So I just want to run something by you. How do you handle that? And uh, that really is very handy. Um, it doesn't cost you anything. Um, uh, but at certain times, um, uh, you, you access each other that way in business. It then, then moves into the, the next stage where informal advisory boards, which is where majority of uh, Australian businesses, when they say they build an advisory board, that's where that, that's what they do. They build an informal advisory board. It's, um, it's unstructured. Generally, the business owner will be um, chairing their own advisory board. Uh, they'll bring in maybe their accountant, some other business people that they know, uh, probably don't pay them um, or pay a minimal amount. Um, and it's a relatively unstructured approach. Sometimes they say they've got an informal advisory board where they just catch up with people one on one, but not collectively as a group. Um, uh, it's it doesn't hold hold you to account, um, and it's and it's not specific to um, uh, specific needs of a business. Um, we see them come and go a lot. People will try and say, "Oh, I tried that, didn't work," um, because it, it hasn't got the structure and due process sitting around it. Business network groups are a, 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 a fantastic mechanism for socialising entrepreneurs and where you may um, uh, get together once a month um, in a formalised uh, networking discussion group forum. There's quite a few around um, and uh, it's a really great way to connect in with peers, share, share challenges and ideas. You become like an advisory board for each other, I guess. Um, um, uh, but, uh, um, but it's broad and the subjects can change, you can bring guest speakers in and things like that. It, it really serves a certain purpose um, in the market um, and a, a lot of businesses in the mid-market uh, go to those uh, business network groups. The next stage is working one-on-one -on -one with either a business coach, a mentor, consultant um, or an accountant. Um, uh, that's really when you're starting to move into the advice stage. Um, having somebody in a paid capacity that has professional indemnity insurance um, and uh, you are getting um, um, expert advice and recommendations um, from somebody that's in the know. Um, it is one-on-one, -on -one, it's linear um, and it may be on a project basis um, or it could be ongoing as well. A formalised advisory board is the next step up where you have a charter, um, you have uh, a, an independent chairperson who's certified um, that will identify where the business needs are, the key priorities, and then build the advisory board based around those uh, priorities and select and help the business owners select the advisors for that model. An advisory board in a formal capacity will generally, uh, the business owner will work with the uh, with the independent chairperson on a monthly basis and um, and then have quarterly meetings when the advisors come in. Um, so that's a, that's a formalised go, go, um, advisory board. And then the most formal approach is governance boards. We have uh, board of directors. They most commonly meet 10 to 12 times a year. Um, it's binding to the business and it's binding to those directors. So it is a very serious undertaking. Um, and whatever um, uh, it says and goes, it's, it's a decision on that governance board table. Um, it, um, the expectation is that it, it is in, implemented inside the business and the business itself is being held to account. Um, so that's the most formal approach. Um, one, again, one doesn't, um, uh, is not more important uh, than another. It's about looking at what is the most appropriate mechanism of engaging advisors at the time for uh, business owners. The conversations just on that model um, shift. So from the um, informal sort of stage, 
the conversations around family and friends and people that that um, like what you're doing, who love you, who want the best from you, they'll be really supportive conversations, but not necessarily the right targeted conversations around business. When you're around business networks um, and informal um, advisory boards, they're really networked conversations, um, a lot of idea sharing, uh, sharing of experience, um, uh, versus when you get to the formalised area or formal advisory boards and governance boards, it's really specific. It's a very targeted conversation around things that matter the most um, and um, really um, um, uh, robust in a way to be able to support the best decision that could be made um, for the business and for the business owner. So it's a much more targeted approach. Um, so that's where advisory boards are and it's about um, what it, what's important for my business, what's the right conversation that we need to have around that business and what's going to give us the competitive advantage uh, based on the decision that we make. Um, so it's very deliberate. Uh, last year, um, I'm, I'm a bit of a, um, a researcher, so I've established a research institute since 2002, studying Australian entrepreneurs. Um, we um, extended that study last year to um, um, research the advisory community based on their experience on 3,000 businesses um, in our market, the $1.5 to $100 million turnover businesses. And the top reasons that was identified for Australian businesses to have an advisory board was to, number one, support growth strategies. Um, uh, the next one was to increase the value of a business. And the third was around expanding operations. Now, advisory board could be for the whole business or it could be for a specific thing. And not everything is always about growth either. It could also be a specific stage that a business is in. It could be around, um, it's an emerging business, a growing business, could be changing. And it could also be exiting. Succession planning is a key trigger um, in, um, in ageing businesses and ageing business owners as well. Um, so, um, ma maximising the value of business, though, for um, uh, for advisory boards is generally a key driver uh, for most. Um, we've connected in with the BDC, uh, which is the like the business bank in Canada. Um, they did a research project in 2014, um, uh, identifying the size of the advisory board market in Canada. It's the first research that's um, that's been done internationally on advisory boards. Um, I had um, very good meetings with them and we're going to be doing data sharing and collaboration um, over a period of time as we continue to measure formalised advisory boards in the market here. But in Canada, um, it's very interesting where advisory boards um, uh, service 6% of businesses in Canada. Um, and the net result of um, the effectiveness of advisory boards, there is an impact of 24% on their annual sales growth. The advisory board was contributed to increasing 18% um, uh, of productivity and 80% of businesses would do it again. Um, so that I, that's, that's quite a significant result. Um, in Australia, where Canada has 6% of businesses that have advisory boards, here we don't know because the majority of them um, are, are conducted informally. As we build and support, we're, we're, we're built as, a, as, a, as, a, as, an, as an industry group. So we're here to support the growth of the uh, advisory board community. Businesses access our network for free. Um, and ours, our role is to really support the quality growth of advisory boards um, in Australia and our target is to build 2% of businesses having advisory boards um, in the next year starting from the 1st of July. So that gives us 3,000 advisory boards that we want to build and support entrepreneurs, those that are ready um, in the market. So we're pretty excited about that. It's a big challenge but when you look at the kind of net results that an advisory board has and in the Canadian research it's been tested, it's been validated. There is no reason why Australian businesses can't benefit 
from um, from formalised advisory boards and get the results that our mid market really needs because that's where mid market is where uh, jobs growth is, increasing productivity, um, and direct investment back into communities. Um, so um, uh, we're up we're up for that challenge. Uh, it's it's going to be a good challenge to have, um, but we'd be extremely proud to be supporting Australian businesses um, to achieve these kinds of. Uh, kinds of results and to also connect in with the other international researchers in looking at what's happening in other countries as well, which is part of why we did our trade mission to China last week. Um, so getting back to you, what's important for you, um, um, if you're in business and you may be a startup uh, through to a $100 million business, the question is, are you ready for an advisory board and um, is it the right mechanism uh, for me? Um, it, it's most people have the question, um, not necessarily when is it right for me, but but how do I actually do it? Um, because your business could be at any stage. Um, um, if you um, have an open mind, are able to uh, listen to advice from others, which I find is actually a, a barrier to some people where they won't listen to other people's advice. An advisory board's not going to be the right model for, for those that, that don't want to take that on and um, and challenge themselves. Um, but but the, so, so the question is, is less about when is the right time, but, but how do you actually um, implement advisory boards? Um, the method that uh, we uh, uh, built over five years, um, um, uh, I'll, I'll just go back and tell a story. Um, my previous business, when I had that advisory board, we built it to 135 offices in eight countries, and my advisory board was with me all that way through our growth, through to international, and then my exit. And I thought I was going to retire, and I just had uh, colleagues in business um, contact me and say, hey, Louise, we saw what your advisory board did for you. Can you help us set up ours? And um, I, uh, I thought, well, if I'm going to do this, I'm going to do it well um, and I'm going to test and build models and validate um, a model that can be shared with other people. Um, and one of the secrets that I found to building an advisory board was actually the establishment phase. Um, and um, I, I created a model that just works every time um, by taking three months of doing a board readiness assessment. It's a half a day a month to work with a business owner to get themselves ready. Um, and um, it's, it's, um, it, it's a fantastic process because it gives the business owner time to evaluate what their needs are um, and to explore what would work for, what, what would work for this business um, and what won't. And that helps to build a really good charter and to identify um, what are the priorities that the advisory board should be focusing on, ver on versus what our management team should be focusing on or my role as a director um, or my governance board, if you've got one, uh, should be focusing on. You, you don't want to have the same conversation being uh, repeated in different forms because it would just drive everybody crazy um, and you won't get results. Um, so you've got to explore what your options are and what the structure is and build the structure that's purposeful. Um, it gives everybody a job to do. Um, and set the expectations and this is what the conversations are about. So you're, you're prepared, your advisors are prepared, um, everyone does their homework and everyone's got something to contribute to, um, to the, the, the critical challenges and opportunities that are being addressed by that advisory board. Um, so it helps to evaluate your needs, explore your options and then define the right structure. Um, so board readiness is done by, um, by a certified chair um, and it's half a day a month and then uh, in that there's an action, plan, action planning piece um, and that gives you some things to do while you're still operating your business. It doesn't hit your time too hard and it doesn't hit your cash too, too hard either and you're giving yourself time to readjust how you, you're not changing what you're doing, you're just adjusting how you're doing things um, and giving you time to do that without impacting on your um, uh, business as usual. 
Um, I'll give you an, uh, just two, two case studies of two fantastic uh, Brisbane-based businesses. Cleanworks is a, is a great business um, and two business partners have started this business when they were 14 years old. Um, it's, um, a cleaning, uh, it's a cleaning business for um, industrial, they do a lot in the school sector um, and, um, and then also office, office spaces as well. Got a great business, but they they really want to grow it, and they've got the foundations of good quality in their business. And so we did a board readiness assessment. Um, uh, it took, took us three months to do it, um, and then uh, they've now got a, an advisory board um, structure in place with a certified chair. And they've got three advisors um, that meets on a quarterly basis. So Bernard's their chair. He meets with um, uh, with the directors on a monthly basis, and then the three advisors come in at the quarterly meetings. And because we do, we have a monitoring system, we know that they've already had an impact of over 14% improvement in their confidence in their business model and how they're doing business. And that's, you know, they're, they're only uh, six months in. Um, so it's uh, already a great story uh, to tell um, with, with what they're doing. Um, and if they've been looking for a great business uh, to, to work with around commercial cleaning, uh, these, these guys are, are really on their A game and they want their advisory board to make sure that they are pushing their business to maximise the opportunities that they have in the market. Um, another business uh, uh, that I deeply admire is Templeton's Financial. Uh, they did a board readiness assessment uh, a year and a half ago and uh, built an advisory board uh, with a certified chair and, uh, and two advisors. So it's interesting when we did the board of readiness assessment, they didn't want people from the financial services sector. Um, they wanted people um, who really understood the B2B marketing and, uh, and the marketplace for where their future business would be. Uh, so Sandra Poon works with them again on a monthly basis. She did the, um, uh, the establishment of, uh, of uh, refining their charter and then uh, brought on the advisors uh, that are specific um, uh, for the key markets uh, that's driving their, their growth and they are really on their A game. Um, um, Anthony Jones is uh, the principal and for him it's all about um, um, uh, understanding new mask markets and really manage the, the risks um, of future growth and challenging their, their assumptions. They've been in business for 25 years and so they wanted a real fresh approach um, and to crack you know, you get, in, you get caught into being stuck in the way that you normally do business. They are totally unstuck now. Um, and they've really broadened out their network and their, their peer network and their contacts and the opportunities have really just opened up because they've got a whole fresh approach to the way they're managing their advisory board um, in, in place. So practical ways to get started. Um, uh, first of all, first of all, identify what your needs are, and then from those those needs, we like to look at what are your top three priorities for your business. That's always a good starting point, and work out how do I address that, and, and maybe review how am I addressing that now? How am I engaging with advisors? Is it a, a, am I am I asking enough from my advisors? Am I working proactively with them or reactively? Maybe that you just need to adjust the way you're working with your existing advisors. Um, if you need a fresh approach, um, then once you've identified your needs and your options, uh, building the charter, getting that really well done and thinking clearly about the consequences of what's in that charter and then building the advisor profiles uh, that's going to, what kind of experience, um, uh, skills, contacts do I need to be able to tap into? And that's when, um, that's what we do, we then do the advisor, advisor profiling um, and um, uh, from that um, with uh, the advisory board centre we send out expressions of interest out to a pool of people that have been pre-qualified um, and then business owners can select from that particular group for free um, So and then engage with those advisors independent um, directly between that advisor and yourself. We don't take a rebate or a fee out of that, and nor does anybody else. You've got to make sure that everybody's independent of each other, sitting on your advisory board, to ensure you've got good governance around it. It's not a governance board, but you need really good governance that sits around that advisory board structure. And then engage with those advisors. They have their own proposal formats and engagement is directly between you and them. Um, the, uh, I just want to talk about the advisor profiling. Um, 
we, we do a pre-selection process because uh, we find that there's a lot of people who want to become advisors and sit on advisory boards. Many do not qualify and shouldn't. Um, so we have a selection process, but it's a five hour process per person. And we select less than 5% of everybody that, that applies. Um, that pre-selection process enables businesses to access people they'd normally not be able to access. Because we know we all go to our immediate bubble, who do we know? And we don't very often get beyond that. Um, and so this enables all of us to be able to access fantastic people who are in the know, not people who have been there, done that, but people who are out there doing it right now. Now there's two, two groups of, of people that we, that, that we uh, look for, for advisors. We look for entrepreneurs that have built a business over $10 million uh, uh, and uh, have been highly successful in that. And then we also look for people who are C-suite executives, people who are known to be leaders in their field, who have a background um, in specific um, areas and also um, are, are deeply focused on business excellence. Um, now, they really drive um, excellence and follow through and really good quality thinking on advisory board. Um, so we have uh, people like the Head of International Business Development for Boeing, the Head of Climate Change Authority, the next Chief of Staff to the Prime Minister. Um, uh, we've got people who are uh, lead, uh, lead specialists in the tech sector um, and in the emerging markets um, and right across Australia in Singapore and also in Shanghai. Um, uh, so there's, it's important that we've got an Australian focus but also an international focus to help businesses uh, with their international strategies and diversification of their business models as well. And people who are in market, not being there in the market 10 years ago. So they're that, the types of people that when you want to engage with advisors, engage with the right adv advisors that are really going to unlock value. So this kind of support network that we have available for business owners. Remember, there's no cost to do that. Um, people pay to be selected in our group, so that's our economic model. Um, but the support network you can access is we have people who are certified chairs. Uh, they have, they um, have completed the Institute of Company Directors course or something similar. Um, and then we train them on top of that um, uh, in a masterclass to become a certified chair. And we support those chairs as they are supporting businesses. We have approved advisors and that's the, the network of around 150 people that you can access across Australia now um, that sit on, that make themselves available to sit on um, advisory boards um, uh, for quarterly meetings. And then we have recognised experts. They don't actually sit on the advisory board but they get, they get things done. Uh, so we find that when a business gets ready for an advisory board there are some, some things that might be missing. Um, in your governance. So maybe things like shareholders agreements, wills and estates, um, licensing agreements, employment law issues, uh, digital strategy, technology investment. Um, uh, they may need commercialisation type um, experience and expertise that may, you may not need that ongoing on your advisory board but you need people to come in and do those things. We also pre-select them. It's also important for you to know that when you have advisors on your advisory board that advisory board will generally be working with you from an 18 month to a three year um, approach. You don't want them coming in into your business also and doing other things because it creates a conflict of interest um, and also potentially for them to become a shadow director. You do not want to do that and they don't want to be doing that either. So having experts helps to safeguard the whole ecosystem um, and the longevity of the advisory board because they, you, they're not getting too close and getting inside your business and mixing up the roles um, as well. So um, it, it's, it's about improving the way that you engage with your advisors and being connected and for us to be able to fast track that connection as this formalised advisory board market um, matures in Australia, um, of which it is and I'm really very, very um, pleased to be seeing the uh, development of this market since February um, uh, last year um, and for us to continue to foster the, the slow um, growth of this um, in, um, in a real good quality way. So we want to make sure that you're engaging with good quality people um, at the same time. Um, so it's helpful to fast track that. So the kind of support that, that um, 
that we, we can help you with if, if advisory boards, formalised advisory boards is, is something of interest for you is help you to evaluate what your options are, to help find a certified check um, um, to help you with that longer term strategy um, and also with the protocols to help you establish your advisory board and connecting with those, um, connecting in with advisors that you would normally not be accessing um, in your, in our day-to-day -day operations. Um, if, um, if, if you want more details on how to establish an advisory board, um, just uh, just email me and I'm happy to share um, uh, more, more about the content of, um, of the establishment phase. Um, so so that's, um, that's that part from me. So John, I'm sorry I've uh, been talking lots um, and I didn't get a yeah, chance for you to step in. So um, over to you. Oh, no, no, you're on a roll and we enjoyed every minute of it. Thank you so much. <laughs> <You're welcome. laughs> um, so we do have some questions. Um, we'll start off with Louis uh, here. Um, he made the comment and question, I can see why the chair is important for a governance board, but why is it so important to have a certified chair uh, of an advisory board? And Rolf follows up with, yeah, what is a certified chair? Yeah, so it, it's a really good question. Um, and I see it often that a business owner will try and chair their own meetings and that's when it becomes an informal advisory board. Um, I, I liken it to, you know, when you try and take a selfie photo um, and you've got the, the camera out there and you put you try and put your own head in it and, and maybe some other people's. Generally, you only get half your head in the photo. <laughs> and it's a bit the same as when you're trying to chair your own advisory board because you you're trying to manage the meeting you can't actually participate you, you and and uh, get the most out of other people because you, there's too many things going on and you can't actually be totally 100 percent engaged in it and you're trying to control it you may miss you, know, you may miss something because uh you're not focused on listening to what's going on and being in a deep conversation um and when you've got an uh, somebody who's an expert facilitator. Um, a, a certified chairs generally come from a background of a CEO, CFO or an expert facilitation background. Um, and, uh, and they're trained in this space specifically on how to uh, make sure that the business owner is supported, not judged, um, and to be able to have the right conversation so that uh, the business owner is able to extract as much value out of the advisors and the advisors have enough space to also contribute. I do see it when a business owner uh, chairs their own meetings that you can, get, you can get caught up in your own story and uh, we'll be talking about your own business because we all fall in love with our own businesses, right? We talk away. And we forget to actually ask their advisors to contribute. And, and, and you get to the end of the meeting and you go, well, that was no good. Uh, they, they really didn't give me much um, and because it's just not, not enough space uh, and, and too many things going on. So certified chair knows this um, and they are looking after the needs, not only for the business and what the business agenda is, they're also really mindful of the needs of the business owner. And if those meetings are not managed carefully, it can go pear-shaped really quickly. Uh, when a business owner feels like they're not being listened to or not being not, not judged uh, or not getting the information the right way so that uh, the chair really manages that, makes sure the advisors are prepared and are contributing um, and, the, and the agenda stays on track because uh, uh, business owner, oh, look, I do it too, you, you give me half a chance and I'll, I'll be chasing a butterfly and try and shift the conversation and not stay on track and you, you end up missing the point. Um, so a certified chair is, is extremely um, invaluable um, in that process. I have an independent chair for my advisory board and I know I can I can just uh, be part of that meeting instead of trying worrying about managing it and I can really, uh, I get double the amount out of my meetings when I have an independent chair. Wow, that's pretty cool. Um, so another one for you from uh, Frank Stadler. Um, can you say something about benefits advisors gain from their work on advisory boards with the view to get ideas as to how one attracts advisors? 
So, John, can you run that question by me again? So I'm clear. Can you say something about the benefits advisors gain from their work on advisory boards with a view to get ideas as to how one attracts advisors? So I think it's just focusing on the benefits, potential benefits for advisors in order to increase incentivization. Right, so um, maybe maybe if I answer the first part of it um, around the benefits of uh, advisors working on advisory boards. Um, um, it, um, if we take a step back, consultants will generally work on a piece of work where there's beginning, middle and end um, and it's linear. When you are sitting on an advisory board and uh, it's on a quarterly basis, you don't get caught up in the business, uh, so you're able to really maintain your objectivity. There's other people sitting around the table as well, so it's, uh, it's about the conversation. Everything's about the quality of the conversation. Um, and you're not being tapped into because uh, you need to have all the answers. No one has all the answers, and I, I think um, uh, that that's been a dilemma in the past where we look for one person to have all the answers and all the recommendations from one person. I, I don't think it's fair, um, and it's not realistic, and uh, it's not realistic for business owners to say, you, you're going to have all the answers for me. So when you've got an advisor, it kind of takes the pressure off you having to have all the answers. It's what the business owner decides to do at the back end. That's what's important. It's not what you know that's what's important. It's about how is that relevant for that business owner. So it really is an extremely practical way to get results and for you to be able to contribute to it um, and, um, and being part of a broader conversation to road test ideas. It's a very honest way of being an advisor and you, uh, I get deep satisfaction out of doing that um, and in helping that business owner grow and grow up in the way that they make their decisions instead of blaming somebody else, which often happens when it's a one-on-one -on -one relationship. Well, you told me to do that or someone told me to do that and it didn't work. Um, it, it's a bit of a cop-out. So um, when you're an advisor, um, uh, you've got to be careful about what comes out of your mouth because uh, you've got to own it. It's got to be your own direct experience. It's got to be relevant and it's got to be current. Um, and um, uh, uh, when, you, when you've experienced and you might be in, been around for a while, a bit like me, you go, well, what, is, what does current actually mean? We see one of the key things for advisors is that currency means that it's been your direct experience. Um, and you've had that direct experience within the last five years. If it's something that's been your experience longer than that, you've got to second guess, is that actually still relevant today? So for advisors, the benefits about being part of something bigger um, and uh, being um, robust in the conversations um, to have different decisions that haven't been predetermined in the past. Um, it's exciting to be involved in and it's um, and you also gain a lot from that as well because there is that socialisation component to it where you are uh, problem solving with other advisors who are also on their A game. Um, so we all learn and benefit from that. Um, oh, yeah. Does that answer the question there, John, for you? I think, I think it does, but um, if, if there are any more questions around that, just comment there. Um, we do have another one and it's kind of an interesting one. I know that you stated that um, the chair is responsible for kind of governing how the the advisory board itself works. But we have a question here: Is the advisory board or the chair uh, advisory board responsible for its own management, or is that dependent on the the appointed chair or the person who um, who the advisory board is advising to manage? Okay, so who, who's accountable for what? Um, yeah. I think maybe I answered that way. The business owner is accountable for their own advisory board. Um, the uh, the chair will uh, go through a, a board readiness assessment, um, support the business owner in developing the charter. The charter is then owned by the business, not by the chair. Um, and the business owner, um, uh, the chair then helps to put out an expression of interest uh, in identifying those three priorities for the business. Expression of interest goes out to advisors. The business owner um, interviews the um, advisors, not the chair, and the decision about the appointment of those advisors is by the business owner and not the chair. And so this is, it's not, it's not around ownership, it's about who owns it. Um, and to be accountable um, and um, stand up for this is the decision that I am making um, as a business owner. So there's nowhere to hide. 
uh, with that decision. So if something goes pear-shaped, something's not quite, quite right, you might have an advisor that, that no longer, their skill set's no longer relevant for, for where that business is going. That agreement could be cut at any time and you don't have any vicarious liability sitting between the chair and the advisors. Everybody has to be independent. So if you've got an, in a, a situation where you're seeing an advisory board being established and the chair is front and centre of everything, then um, uh, then it, it's, it's problematic long term. The chair is there to support the business owner and helping them to stay on track, to mentor them between the meetings, to make sure the meeting agenda is on, on track, um, but the business owner needs to own their own decisions about the composition of their advisory board. Um, if, if they don't, it's um, you, you've, got, you've got governance issues right up front. That's very cool. Um, Frank would like to know, uh, what are the formats of engagement with advisory boards with regard to meetings, uh, online versus in person, uh, in physical meetings, and how frequent or how uh, how many times should you meet in a month or, or a year? Yeah, that's a, that's a good, good question. Uh, thanks, Frank. Um, so um, it, it could be online, it could be, uh, it could be face to face, you know, there, there is a preference for face to face. Um, uh, but you might have an advisory board that is uh, specific to a purpose. So you might have an advisory board that's being built not for the whole business, but for a particular strategy. You've got the flexibility to do that, right? And so one of the uh, one of one um, format is when you've got an advisory board to help a business go international. Now you may want to tap into. Um, advisors that are in market rather than in country and it, it, it can be a bit of a logistical nightmare if you try and get everybody together. My chair is in Shanghai um, so we have our format um, of um, a advisory board meeting being an online meeting uh, once a, um, uh, twice a year and then face to face twice a year. So we, we, uh, we, change, we change that out. So meeting four times a year is the most common approach. Uh, six times a year is, is good for businesses that are more at, at a, a high, high risk or high moving. There's a lot, a lot of things going on. But uh, more than six times a year, you would start questioning whether that advisory board is getting involved in operations or is involved in decision making. So I think if you're meeting more than six times a year, you, you could be running into uh, the question of becoming shadow directors. Um, so I'm not a fan of that. You may have a time where you might need to meet once a month for three months because there's a specific strategy or crisis that, 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 um, that's being addressed. Um, but that, that, is, uh, that, that wouldn't be the norm, I would say. So um, uh, when it's face-to-face, -face, the meetings are generally um, a half a day. Um, when it's online, you pretty much run out of steam after an hour and a half. Um, so um, um, I, I, wouldn't, I personally would like to be in an online meeting for longer than an hour and a half. So it uh, uh, makes it really concise. But um, if your agenda is really tight, you can achieve a lot in that time. The, the chair is, is the one that meets with business owners on a monthly basis. So the advisors don't need to get caught up in, and know, they, they don't need to know everything that's going on. Business. Um, and sometimes the less, less you know, the more effective you are because you're not getting caught up in the noise. Uh, you're, getting, you're, you're really staying on, on track with, with the agenda and the priorities that need to be addressed strategically that's been identified right up front. It is important though to reevaluate those priorities once a year or once every 18 months to make sure that your priorities that you're addressing on the advisory board is actually what the business needs as it changes over time. Seems fair. Um, kind of a two-part question, and it's both from Lisa and Rolf, so thank you both for this one. But um, Lisa asks, is there a cost involved in having an advisory board? And, and Rolf follows that up with, uh, are you aware of any grants to support startups to set up a formal advisory board and government systems in general? Yeah, okay, uh, good, good question, um, uh, both of them. So uh, the costs of an, an advisory board, um, I'm not a believer in people not being paid. Um, I think we've got a cultural issue around that um, in Australia, where we expect people who have really earned their experience and their contacts to do it for free. Um, uh, I, I think we need to move away from that, including not-for-profits. Um, I know it's controversial, but that, that's my opinion. Um, uh, generally, an advisory board, you pay, pay the advisors per meeting, which can be anything from 
know, thousand to five thousand dollars a meeting, or even ten thousand if you've got if you've got someone who's who's really um, um, uh, uh, is there for a specific uh, cracking open uh, a market or a strategy. Um, but that's that's not common though. Um, uh, so uh, a, a chair will work on a retainer. Uh, on a monthly basis. So generally an advisory board costs between thirty dollars to $40,000 a year for a really good advisory board um, structure. So it's not expensive in, in the scheme of things for what you can, what, what you gain from it. Um, the grants that are available, um, Aus Industry um, advisory boards is included in the entrepreneurs grant as a, as a category um, and um, uh, We've, we've referred a lot of businesses to Oz Industry um, for that grant, um, and also Queensland Government. There's uh, there's um, advisory boards is included on those grants as well, um, and uh, uh, it, it goes a long way. So the Entrepreneurs Program, just as an example, it's twenty thousand so dollars. That pays for you know half of your advisory board um, uh, costs, um, and it's a match funding uh, initiative anyway. Um, what what's been interesting with um, uh, with the grants is um, in the past, and I've interviewed, I think there's about 140 Oz industry advisors around the country. I've, I've, I've met with most of them. And for years they've been, they've been having on their action plan saying you need an advisory board for your business um, and giving that as an action item. And it often doesn't get followed through on because there's actually been no process, no how. There is, there is now. Um, so there's a, there's a good due process that, that can fit under under those grants. Brilliant. Um, one question here, Marisha, would like to ask, um, has kind of a touchy subject, how do you ask someone to leave an advisory board? Um, I've had a situation where um, uh, we've had to close the advisory board down um, uh, because I mean, I was an experienced chair, but I, I missed, I missed something that I shouldn't have missed, um, and uh, the there was a, a moment in time where we pushed a particular topic too far, one time too many, that the business owner didn't want to go there, and I missed, I missed the cue. It was also time for that advisory board to finish anyway. An eighteen month. 18 month is is, uh, is a timing for an advisory board that's a business in transition and generally those advisors should turn over at that time and then have a new advisory board because that business should be addressing different issues. So I missed that cue for this particular one where we had um, the priorities set uh, but they'd been addressed and we should have moved on with regards to the priorities. So um, um, and we, we had to close that advisory board down um, um, and, and that can happen from time to time, um, uh, but that was my fault on that particular one. Um, uh, so I sank myself. Uh, so that's one way to do it. <laughs> uh, and uh, uh, Another way is just saying, you know, the agreement is directly between the business owner and the advisor and the business owner um, has the right at any time with our proposal formats that our advisors use to close that, to, to close that engagement because you get paid per meeting. You don't want a dysfunctional advisory board. You, there's no point to prove, right? So um, just don't do it. Um, uh, so um, uh, it's, that's where we all got to be grown up and just know well, we know that this gig is uh, uh, it stands on its own merit. If it's not working, you cut it. Um, and that, that that includes the whole advisory board, all the engagement with one individual, an individual advisor. Um, but the the best way is um, to reevaluate the priorities that you're establishing every 18 months, oh sorry, every 12 months to 18 months and then reassess how we got the right advisors and the right chair for what's fit for purpose. Everybody knows that it's not, not the, the advisory board is not there forever. They have the expectation that they will be turned over um, and it all comes down to what is the best result for the business. When we deal with our code of ethics, so our, all our advisors, they have a full orientation after their pre-selection we've got a code of ethics and all roads lead back to what is the best outcome for the client and that is the right thing to do. Good policy. Um, so on that note, uh, Travis would like to know, is it better than to have a focused board um, or is a board comprised of a, from different experts from various fields a better choice for an advisory board? 
uh, the best advisory boards are those that are fit for purpose. So work out what, what, what does the business need, what those priorities are, and then, and then get the profiles of those advisors to meet that need. Um, and uh, you, you don't want two or three of the same type of person around your advisory board. The diversity around that advisory board becomes its strength. Um, and having uh, different experiences. So this is where when you've got an entrepreneur and a C-suite executive as an example, who have got different skills and experience um, and a different view on how business is done. It's extremely exciting um, when you have that conversation. Um, so don't just pick anybody um, because they're in good, good in business. Work out what does your business need and then choose the advisors that got that experience that you want and need to tap into, as well as what kind of contacts they have that could really unlock a lot of value in the market for them as well and do that. Um, don't just do a generic saying, I need, I want an accountant, I want a lawyer, and I want a sales and marketing person, and just having that as a A-team um, without going the due diligence of, of really understanding deeply about who, who do we really need. Don't do a generic advisory board because they just don't last. Very sound advice. I think we've reached the end of our question. So um, thank you everyone for attending the webinar today. Please remember to download the handouts before you exit and please stay in touch with Innovate Queensland via the GRID group on LinkedIn so you can find out about future webinars and events. Um, the GRID work program is, helping, is about helping and helping you with the implementation of innovation in your business. So we'll send you a short survey and use your responses to tailor the grid program to meet your interests and needs. Um, Louise, thank you so much for donating your time and expertise. It's greatly appreciated and, and I really hope you get better. Um, <laughs> thank you everyone for tuning in um, and we'll see you next time in grid. Thanks, John. Take care.